Welcome to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. Welcome, and in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about dietary and nutritional supplements, which are a widespread, massive industry, but do they work? And once again, the answer is, it depends. By the very nature of the word, the intent is to supplement one's diet, not necessarily replace or cover for a bad diet. That said, the average person is likely to have a diet in which not all of their vitamin, mineral, fiber, or micronutrient needs are being met, hence the potential benefit of supplementation. Now, scientific evidence shows that there are certainly some dietary supplements that are beneficial for overall health and managing some health conditions. For example, calcium and vitamin D support strong bone health. Omega-3 fatty acids from fish oils might help some people with heart disease. And vitamin C and E are antioxidants that help to prevent cell damage and help to maintain overall health. So with more than probably half of the U.S. population taking a dietary supplement, either daily or on occasion, it's worth taking a closer look at this rather complex topic. As always, one should consult with their healthcare professional to determine which, if any, nutritional supplements you might want to take. But let's dive in. So as I mentioned, the dietary supplement industry in the United States is a $40 billion plus juggernaut, and globally, that number jumps to over $115 billion from an industry perspective. And it's expected to grow at roughly an 8% CAGR through the year 2025. And so the consumer attitude is very positive regarding dietary supplementation because of the added health and wellness perceived benefits. You have a rising geriatric population, so people are getting older across the country. You have increasing health care costs, so people are looking for ways to optimize their health without going to see the doctor necessarily. You have lifestyle changes, innovations in different types of foods and food preparation. You have different new medical discoveries. So a lot is changing around dietary, nutritional supplementation, and potential health benefits derived from these. So when one refers to dietary and nutritional supplements, to what are they actually referring? So I'm going to break it down into roughly, and this is a rough approximation of seven different types of supplement categories. And the goal here initially is just to give a very, very high level overview of what the seven categories are and what are some examples that constitute supplements in that category. So the first category is vitamins which most people have heard of. These are things like vitamin A, C, D, E, K, riboflavin, niacin, which is vitamin B3. There's vitamin B6, folic acid, vitamin B9, B12. So a lot of people are familiar with the vitamin category. The second category is minerals. These are things like potassium, calcium, sodium, table salt, magnesium, iron, zinc, copper, chromium, molybdenum, selenium, just to give you a few examples. The third category of dietary supplements, what I would call proteins and amino acids. And to subdivide amino acids even further, there are essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids. Now, essential amino acids cannot be manufactured by the body. So as a result, they must come from food or supplementation. So there are nine essential amino acids and three branch chain aminos. So the branch chain amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And the remaining six essential amino acids are phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, thionine, lysine, and histidine. Now, the ones you hear most often are the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, largely due to their role in protein synthesis and muscle repair. So all three of those are heavily involved in protein synthesis, muscle repair, metabolism, muscular regeneration, and energy production. Okay, the fourth category is one I'll kind of generically call it bodybuilding supplements. So these, while they there is some overlap, it does include things like protein drinks and some branch chain aminos. It also has supplements like glutamine, arginine, creatine, and a host of other 
weight loss and fat loss products. So the fifth major category is essential fatty acids. And these are comprised of three subcategories, omega-3 fatty acids, probably heard of those, omega-6 fatty acids, and omega-9 fatty acids. So let's tackle omega-3 fatty acids first. And those are probably one of the most world's most studied nutrients. And there are three most common. There is EPA, DHA, and ALA. So EPA really helps reduce with inflammation, also helps reduce symptoms of depression. DHA is extremely important for brain development, brain function, brain health. And ALA is used by the body primarily for energy. Now, these three omega-3 fatty acids have, through various studies, been shown to be quite powerful in some of its health benefits in improving things like blood triglycerides, improving fatty liver, combating depression and anxiety, reducing inflammation and pain, help with asthma, and things of that nature. So they're pretty widely studied, pretty well understood, and those are the three primary omega-3 fatty acids. Like the omega-3 fatty acids, the omega-6 fatty acids are polyunsaturated fatty acids and they're primarily used for energy. So the most common omega-6 fat is linoleic acid. There's also GLA and CLA that are, again, also used for primarily energy. And the third and final category of the fatty acid category is omega-9 fatty acids. These are monounsaturated fatty acids. And oleic acid is the most common omega-9 fatty acid. But the omega-9 fatty acids aren't strictly essential, so they can be produced by the body. So the sixth category of dietary and nutritional supplements are what I would call natural products. So these are using extracts from usually plants or animals or algae. And some examples here are things like ginkgo biloba, turmeric curcumin, cranberry St. John's wort, ginseng, glucosamine, collagen. So a large product category unto itself. The seventh major category of dietary and nutritional supplements is probiotics. And the theory here is the large intestine is the host of thousands of species of microorganisms, mostly bacteria, that number in the trillions. And probiotics is a category of dietary supplementation that holds that orally consuming specific live bacteria. It's possible to influence large intestine microbiotics with additional health benefits. Now, there's various studies on this gastrointestinal health. And frankly, the results are somewhat mixed by the current body of clinical evidence. So as you can probably tell by now, just these seven categories have potentially hundreds of products in each. So the category of dietary nutritional supplements is massive and growing by the day. So I wanted to mention a bit of brief history on nutrition supplementation and regulation. So looking back, in 1994, Congress passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which allows these categories of products to go to market and requires any policing to be done by the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, after the product is on the market to prove that the product is unsafe. So under this Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, the FDA actually regulates the dietary supplements as food, which means they're not subject to pre-market approval or the same level of effectiveness and safety training required for things like pharmaceutical drugs. However, that same body, the FDA, is responsible for removing unsafe dietary supplements from the market. So what you have is the the vitamin and supplement industry is pretty unregulated. The manufacturer only needs to certify that their products, their supplements are, quote, generally recognized as safe and, two, not intended to treat, diagnose, prevent, or cure a disease. 
And just a trivial factoid, since the enactment of the DSHEA, which is the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, the dietary supplement industry in the United States has grown from about a $4 billion industry with around 4,000 products in the market to a more than $40 billion industry with more than 50,000 different products in the market. So a pretty massive market expansion in the last decade or so. So I thought I would include what I believe, my personal opinion, are the tier one key supplements that you should take. Now, again, you should consult with your healthcare professional before taking any new supplements so you have a complete strategy and plan in conjunction with your healthcare professional. But these are the five that I think one should take. Number one, a multivitamin. So while real food is always the best, so taking a multivitamin is not an answer to a bad diet. It doesn't cover up for a diet that is deficient in a lot of nutrients. But many people also don't get enough of the recommended essential vitamins and minerals through diet alone. So taking a multivitamin can supplement and help one's diet in these cases. Again, not a replacement, but the body needs around 13 vitamins and 16 different minerals that are essential to your health. And I view the multivitamin as a little bit of a backstop. And if you go to www.fitteris.com forward slash 013 for episode 13, you can see a list and links to all of the supplements that I take, including the multivitamin brands that I personally take and that I recommend. The second product I would recommend is a fish oil supplement. I take one, I take about uh, 2.8 grams per day with food. I take just the Costco brand, the Kirkland Signature Wild Alaskan Fish Oil. It's got all eight essential fatty acids in there and all the omega fatty acids. I think it's a good product. The third product I would recommend taking is a vitamin D3. So vitamin D3, it's a fat-soluble vitamin, meaning that it dissolves in fats and oils and can be stored in your body for a long time. And remember, vitamin D is also produced from the cholesterol in your skin when it's exposed to ultraviolet rays from the sun. But the potential health benefits for vitamin D3 are many. I think there's improved strength. There is a reduced risk of osteoporosis. It has shown some studies that it could prevent and help for the prevention of cancer. It reduces the risk of type 1 diabetes in certain studies and overall improving mortality to help you live longer. So I take a dosage that is a little bit on the higher end. I take 5,000 IUs per day. I just use a now supplements brand of vitamin D3. Again, 5,000 IUs, one tablet a day. The fourth supplement that I would recommend one take is magnesium. And getting enough magnesium is essential for maintaining optimal health. There's a lot of benefits to magnesium. It's involved in many, many reactions within the body. It can improve your physical exercise performance can help with brain function, it has benefits against type 2 diabetes, can help to lower blood pressure, has anti-inflammatory benefits, and also can reduce insulin resistance. And so I take about 400 milligrams per day uh, with food, and the brand that I take is uh, Natural Life. And I take a, a glycinate formulation of magnesium for better bioavailability. There are a number of different compounds they just have a little bit different absorption rates and timelines. I happen to like the glycinate formulation. And the fifth and final supplement that I would recommend that people take is vitamin C. There are a lot of studies around vitamin C as a strong antioxidant. It, again, can help battle blood pressure like magnesium. It's been linked to a reduced risk of heart disease. It can also improve the absorption of iron in the body. It can boost immunity while helping white blood cells function more effectively. It can protect your memory and thinking as you age. And it's water-soluble, so it's not stored within your body. So if you consume more than your body needs, it's just excreted in your urine. And again, what I take, I take about 2 to 3 grams per day. I use the Costco brand. Again, you can go to www.fitterist.com forward slash 013 to see exactly what products I take and links to purchase them if you are interested. So in summary, 
The supplement industry is a very complex one with thousands and thousands of products that are generally well intended for better health. However, the explosion of products whose regulation is basically a post-launch takedown regulation if the FDA finds a product to be harmful to health is challenging. The FDA cannot possibly keep up with the sheer volume of products with exotic ingredients that are being introduced and marketed in the health and wellness arena. That said, there are likely some solid staple supplementation that can yield benefits for a large number of people, particularly those whose diets are deficient in key nutrient areas. And in this episode, hopefully we've covered what I believe are at least the tier one basic staples that most people could easily add to their supplement regimen. Now, again, there's no substitute for a great and well-balanced diet loaded with the necessary macro and micronutrients and fiber. But if you need to supplement, these supplements provide a good addition that in consultation with your healthcare professional can help bolster your overall health. Now, in the next episode, we'll talk more about what I refer to as kind of the tier two dietary supplements, which are likely to apply to a smaller group of people, but can still yield potential solid benefits to one's overall health and wellness. We'll talk with you again soon. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen and make it a magical day.